So, um, last time we talked about uh, pseudo random number generators, and I started uh, with. Um, with real random number generators. So the question is how can we get uh, perfect random numbers that really uh, perfectly or almost perfectly fulfill our definitions. Our definition which is um, when we talk about um, random bits they have to be symmetric and independent. That's basically it. Yeah. Um, Yes, and uh, I will now talk about what I learned when I had my sabbatical in the year 2000 um, in the Maxtor company. Um, and here you see a Maxtor hard disk, which I uh, will show you. Um, and what we did um, during this uh, sabbatical was quite funny. I mean, this was really, really fun. Um, we used the physics inside the hard disk to produce randomness. And, I mean, this is currently the only way to get real randomness. We, um, we have to exploit the randomness inside some physical process, because this is the only chance to get real randomness. Huh? Um, yeah, let's, let's start talking about, uh, really, about the basics of randomness. I mean, there is this first philosophical question, is there any randomness in this world? Huh? I mean, there are, um, I would say, religious groups that tell you that everything is deterministic, everything is already determined, so we don't have any influence about how our life develops, everything is predetermined. If this is true, then of course there is no randomness in this world, because no randomness is allowed. But this is kind of religious. Huh? Um, but, of course, there is this basic question, is there randomness in the, this world or is there no randomness? Huh? Yeah, I would say that uh, real random randomness, randomness is not real. I think, I mean, every physical pr process is following any physical values. And physical laws, yeah? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's deterministic anyway. In any way, uh, I mean, uh, it's very, very complicated. Okay, yeah, but I mean, this shows me that you didn't study physics, huh? <laughs> um, at least no physicist would agree with what you said. You said everything is basically deterministic. And um, at least, I mean, you cannot claim this in, in, in this way. Because in, in physics, if you go to the, the, the on the atomic level, uh, uh, then we need to talk about quantum mechanics, and that's the crucial point. I mean, you're right. When when we talk on the macroscopic level, then um, in in theory, you might say everything is deterministic. Huh? If you do, uh, what is billiard in English? Billiard, what's that in English? Pool, okay. Uh, but there is this other way of billiard. Snooker, okay. Uh, I mean, there are these, um, these balls, they hit each other, and in principle, you can exactly determine everything if everything is perfect and the balls are perfectly round and the underground is perfect, under these conditions you theoretically may um, 
give a prognosis about where the ball will be after 10 hits. But this is, this is theory. Yeah? And it is macroscopic. But on the microscopic level, there is quantum mechanics. Yeah? And um, there we do, for example, light has particles. And we know that there is randomness. Yeah? For example, um, there are so many uh, examples and experiments. Um, there is this experiment with the double slot. So you have a light wave, uh, a light beam, And I mean, the distance of these two slots is quite small. Huh? So this is maybe one thousandth of a millimeter. Huh? And then, I mean, we know that light consists of photons. Photons are elementary particles. And now, um, one, one photon after the other hits this wall. And now the question is whether the next photon will hit this slot or this slot. Yeah? And this cannot be determined. This is random. And I mean, you could, you could now detect what happens behind uh, this wall and you will see you cannot, you cannot uh, determine whether the next photon will, will go through here or here and depending on this uh, and, and also there is in interference okay but it really looks what happens here looks perfectly random huh? there is no determinism behind this but I mean you might now say okay uh, and this for, was for a long time a really fundamental question. You might now say, okay, I mean there is something behind, maybe you might call it God, who determines whether this photon goes through the upper or through the lower slot. Yeah? And what looks, what to us looks uh, perfectly random, maybe there is some deterministic process behind which we don't know. Huh? For example, if you do the snooker game after, I don't know, three or four hits of the balls, there is no chance for us to determine what happens. And the reason is that behind there is some randomness. Our balls are not perfectly round and the underground is not perfect. And that's why we cannot determine what's happened, even though it might be deterministic. But we can't, uh, we can't determine because of kind of random noise. Huh? But here the question is, is there behind what we know some deterministic process which we just do not understand? Huh? That's what physicists call the theory of hidden variables. Maybe there are some hidden variables which we don't know. And this was for a long time a really crucial question. This question has been answered maybe about 10 or 15 years ago. There is a so-called Bell inequality in quantum mechanics and for a long time the question was is this, I don't know, is it true or is it not true? But it has been answered by physicists. They made some experiments and can, uh, could prove that there is real randomness in quantum mechanics. There are no hidden variables, so the, in quantum mechanics we do have real randomness. Okay, so now um, this fundamental question is answered. Um, and uh, we can exploit this real randomness. I mean, for our purposes, this actually would not matter too much. Um, let's for a moment assume that there would be these hidden variables behind what we see as kind of randomness. 
then this would not be real random, really random. But for our purposes it wouldn't matter because when we need random numbers for simulation, maybe for cryptography, whatever, if these numbers look perfectly random and we cannot determine whether they are random or not, then they are randomly enough because nobody could determine this. No? Um, but of course, I mean, we can sleep a little bit more quiet when we know there is real randomness behind. Because otherwise, if there would be these hidden variables, then we would have a certain danger. Maybe we construct our cryptographic random number generator that generates our random keys. And suppose the um, United States Secret Service, the NSA, they have excellent researchers and maybe they know the hidden variables but we, do, we don't know. Then maybe they could predict all our random numbers. But because we now know in quantum mechanics there is real randomness and even the NSA cannot predict uh, these real random numbers, so uh, we are a little bit more safe. Okay, um, I mean we, we definitely argue that on a digital computer there is no chance for real randomness. Huh? Uh, so we have to go uh, to the physic, physical level um, and I, uh, yeah, let, let me draw this picture again. I showed you how the process of producing real random numbers goes. So we have some uh, physical source. Last time I, we took a, just an ordinary resistor and the noise on the resistor. But it may be some different uh, physical source. And uh, then we need an amplifier. Then we, uh, the next is an AED, analog digital converter, and out come random bits. Okay, so you need quite a bit of electronics. I mean first there you need the physical source, then you need an analog amplifier, and then you need the AD converter. Um, so if on your PC you want to have random numbers, you need some external hardware. You need this as external hardware. So you would have to buy hardware and I mean this would cost you some money. Maybe 50 euro, maybe 100 euro, maybe 500 euro, depending on the quality uh, you expect from your random numbers. Now let me ask you who would be willing to spend 100 euros for such a, a random bit generator? I can tell you nobody. Huh? This is too much money. You would prefer the pseudo random numbers because they cost you nothing. Huh? And this was basically the idea before uh, I did my sabbatical <coughs> at Maxtor. I guess it was in the year 1999, there was a talk here at our Fachhochschule in the Mittwoch Seminar uh, and uh, the, the talk was given by Erhard Schreck um, and he is a lead, at that time he was a leading researcher at Maxtor in San Jose in Silicon Valley and uh, he was here for the talk because basically he visited his family. He is from Ravensburg and now he works in San Jose. And, uh, and then uh, uh, the Fachhochschule the just took the opportunity and invited him for a talk. And his talk was entitled um, The Physics Inside the Hard Disk. It was a fascinating talk. I uh, attended this talk 
And after the talk, we, uh, as a group of scientists, we went to the restaurant and talked about this. And then uh, I got into contact with Erhard. And when I told him that uh, I, I do some work and teaching in cryptography um, and that we need uh, very good random numbers in cryptography and then he said, oh, I have an idea and we could do some cooperation. Uh, and now he, he brought the idea of why don't we produce random numbers based on a hard disk. And his idea behind that was all these devices are available in any hard disk. There is physical randomness. Look, there is a lot of physics in there. Um, there is, of course, an amplifier. Why is there an amplifier? Because, look, this is the head of the hard disk, and this head writes and reads the bits. And, of course, I mean, this is first, and in the first place, these are analog electrical signals with very, very small amplitude. So these, these signals first have to be amplified. And this all is in here in the firmware here on these, on, on these uh, electronic circuits. There is an analog amplifier. Then, of course, there is an analog digital converter because finally we need uh, digital bits for our computer. So all the hardware we need is already available for free on any hard disk. Yeah? Um, and so his idea was why don't we use the hard disk to generate randomness. And actually um, even more is available on the hard disk. We already do have almost a perfect random number generator on the hard disk. We would just need a little bit of modification in the firmware on the hard disk. Um, and why? I mean, when I, when I did my sabbatical there, I got into contact with many, many people and groups. In San Jose, they, they have the research and development department of Maxtor. And this is, they, they do only research in de and development in San Jose, no production. And they have 500 engineers and scientists just for research and development. And these 500 um, uh, scientists, uh, they are in, in different groups. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure whether I remember everything perfectly. Uh, of course, there is a mechanical engineering group uh, who work on just the mechanics here. This mechanics here and uh, this mechanics of the read-write head and everything. Um, yeah, for example, this ball bearing here for the, for, for, rotate, for the rotating disc has to be extremely accurate. Uh -huh. So the, um, the tolerance, the tolerance in, the, in the bearing has to be, um, or it should be, below one thousandth of a millimeter. Huh? Um, and also here, the, this bearing also. Uh, and uh, next is, of course, it has to be cheap. Huh? So you, you cannot afford for such a bearing to pay uh, ten dollars. Huh? So this is mechanical engineering. Then another interesting uh, department is about aerodynamics. Yeah? Aerodynamics, they, they do have actually engineers coming from avionics. So they previously developed airplanes <coughs> and now they work inside Maxtor because this uh, read-write head um, is not allowed to touch the surface of the disc while it rotates because otherwise it would scratch the surface and you would lose all your bits. Yeah? Um, so it has to fly just a tiny little bit above the surface um, and this, uh, I mean, th this can only be done by aerodynamics. Yeah? It is impossible, I mean, yeah, let's go into this. So. <coughs> Um, 
So the, if this is our flat disk, uh, and here we have the bearing, and then this read write head, oh no, uh, yeah, let's, let me show you. So, we do have the disk here, and there is the read write head. And now, uh, this is the head here. And now let's, let's look at such a cross section, okay? And then this read write head, um, so the disk moves in this direction. And the head is, it's like that. And that's where it's mounted. Huh? So the disk carries air on the surface. So the air on the surface of the disk is flowing in this direction. Huh? And then if this is shaped like the wing of an airplane, then of course there is some resulting force um, moving the head a little bit up from the disk. Huh? And what happens when, when you switch the disk on and the motor starts rotating, then initially there is the parking position of the head which is, I guess it's here, huh? and here the heads crash, but there are no bits on this, on this first track, huh? uh, on the parking position, and then if it starts rotating, then aerodynamic uh, develops and the head lifts off from the surface, and now it can start moving to the real tracks. And now this is, this is one challenge, I was, I was absolutely surprised when I heard this. I mean, we can imagine that the, the angular velocity of the disk is constant. Huh? So the speed doesn't change. And if the speed is constant, then of course engineers might design this head such that uh, it always is in a certain distance to the disk, and this distance has to be extremely small, extremely small, because if the distance is too large, then this head wouldn't be able anymore to read the bits. I mean, this is really, it's cutting-edge technology. What do we want from our hard disk? And you, you see it from year to year. The storage density is getting higher and higher. I, I don't know, maybe a factor of two every two or three years. Um, and this means our bits are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. But physics doesn't uh, um, increase uh, the magnetic um, the magnetic force. The magnetic force is basically constant. They would have to invent every two years new and better magnetic materials, which they don't. Huh? So these are basically constant. The bits are getting smaller and this means the magnetic field is constant. Huh? And that again means that the head has to get closer and closer and closer to the surface huh? in order to be able to still detect these magnetic uh, fields. So the goal is to make this distance as small as possible. Okay, uh, and, and I can tell you that this distance meanwhile is um, in the region of nanometers. Huh? And nanometers is like um, some diameters of atoms between 10 and 100 atom diameters. Huh? Um, yeah. And this has to be controlled. I mean, if everything would be constant, you wouldn't need a control, you just need a perfect design of this head. But now comes the, the interesting point. Look, this read right head moves from the innermost position to the outermost position. 
and the speed of the airflow here is more than twice as big as it's here. Of course, because the velocity out here is much higher. So this is like flying with an airplane with two different speeds. And if you don't change the, the adjustment of the wings and the flaps and everything, then the, the force increases with the speed. The force that lifts the airplane up increases with the speed. So that means if this head is in the outermost position, then it will be lifted up and the distance is higher than it is in the middle. And this doesn't work. And, and, uh, so, and Erhard told me that these engineers, they managed to construct the aerodynamics of this head in a way such that in this area from the innermost to the outermost position, the, the distance is almost perfectly the same. Huh? And uh, so now you can understand why they, uh, uh, they need these aerodynamics engineers. Okay, um, yeah. Then there is uh, another department. I mean, this is a physics department where they, they just develop better magnetic materials. Huh? Uh, and and there are, meanwhile, there are so many different technologies. For example, I guess this here is an aluminum plate um, with um, I guess a chrome dioxide, no, no, it's, it's uh, um, iron dioxide, <coughs> huh? uh, a coating. But it, 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 um, it, all, it, it varies and, and other companies, they for example, don't use aluminum plates, they, they use glass for example. Uh, and these technologies, of course they improve and they are getting better and better. Then there is another department where they sh just work on the, um, the physics of an extremely tiny portion of this head. Oh yeah, maybe I, I'll, I'll let this uh, circulate now and you can look at it. If you look at the, the, the tip of the head, so the, the really the head, which is here, this is about one millimeter by one millimeter. Huh? So it's quite small. Oh yeah, now let's talk about the tracks. There are many tracks on such a hard disk. The number of tracks on such a hard disk, I mean in 2000, in the year 2000, it was around 2000 tracks. Huh? 2000 tracks on 2 centimeters. So this is 1,000 track on, no, sorry, it was not 2,000. It was 10 or 20,000. I don't remember exactly. Suppose it would be 20,000. Yeah? Then we would have 1,000, uh, 10,000 tracks per centimeter, which is 1,000 tracks per millimeter. 1,000 tracks per millimeter. So the distance from one track to the next is one thousandth of a millimeter. And this means if this is one millimeter, then below the head there are one thousand tracks. And this means that the actual portion of the head that reads the bits, now we have to enlarge our head. If this is the head, then somewhere in the middle of the head there is something like that, which is the actual physical read-write device. Huh? Because, I mean, there are 1,000 tracks below here. Huh? It's an extremely tiny read-write device. Huh? Uh, I don't remember what physical effect they use. They, I know it's... I, I think it's not the Hall effect, I don't know. Yeah? I mean, this is really uh, very advanced physics here. Yeah? Uh, 
Yeah, and it's not a coil, it's some physical effect, I don't remember. Yeah, so this is the next department, just about this really tiny read-write device. Um, and yet another department is about control theory. And this is very advanced control theory, what they do there. Look, I mean this read-write head, it has a bearing here, um, and yeah, m maybe we should enlarge this too. Let me draw a new picture. Um, yes, and um, there is uh, the so-called voice coil. I don't remember exactly how it's structured. So here there is an, a magnetic coil. Huh? And on top of this coil, there is a permanent magnet like that. Huh? And if at any time you have a used hard disk which is maybe broken and you want to throw away, don't just throw it away, open it before and then take these one or two permanent magnets out. Because these guys are the strongest magnets you can ever get. Uh, they are extremely strong. I have a, I mean, I have a pin board at home, and I have like 20 of these magnets on the pin board. If you just, it's, it's a, a steel plate, you just put them at a steel plate without any paper in between or anything, you almost can't get them off. You have to take a knife and, and really, uh, it's, they're, they're, it's really tough. Huh? Okay, and now, I mean, this read-write head has to move around here, and that's done by um, putting an, uh, a voltage onto this coil, and then depending on the current, this would, would move around. Um, and now, you can imagine why control is not really easy. You need to have an accuracy here of far below one thousandth of a millimeter. And this means here where the coil is, this is a factor of ten smaller even. Here you need an accuracy in position of maybe one ten thousandth of a millimeter or even smaller. So it must be, and, and this of course is an electrical engineering task. It must be possible to extremely accurately uh, control the voltage at this coil here. And then it's even, it's even more difficult. I mean, there is this one track where the head is at the moment. And you, uh, I mean, you might now think, okay, we have to position it perfectly on this track. And that means we have to keep this position here extremely constant. But this is not a good idea. Because there are these mechanical engineers who develop the ball bearing here in the middle and the motor that drives the whole disc. And these guys are not perfect either. I told you that the accuracy of the bearing here has to be below one thousandth of a millimeter. If the accuracy is one thousandth of a millimeter, and actually meanwhile since 2000 uh, the, the, uh, the number of tracks increased even by a factor of, I don't know, four or eight or something. Yeah? Um, so this means if you keep this position constant, what would happen is that the read-write head would just jump from one track to the next all the time. And this is not really good. So the, uh, the control for this voice coil has to make sure that the read-write head stays on track. And this is like 
suppose the track looks like that. And you have to follow this track with the read-write head. So it has to be adaptively controlled such that it always stays on track. And then of course if you want to control everybody who has uh, done some simple robotics, I mean there are these robots that can follow a line or whatever, it's, it's actually this task, yeah? follow a line. Then of course you need some sensors. You need to know whether you are on track or off track, whether you are to the right of the track or to the left of the track. Everything has to be controlled. And that's, that was actually one, uh, one of our sources for randomness. And that's what you can see here on this image. Wo ist denn der Zeigestock? Ah, ja, danke. Okay, so look, these lines here are lines parallel to a track. I don't, I don't actually know, I mean, yeah, but here we have actually a couple of tracks. Yeah, look, if we look at these, these are the so-called bursts, these black uh, rectangles. We have one, two, three, four, is this also one? No, it doesn't look like four, yeah. Four of these uh, rectangles, so, I mean, I don't remember all the details, but, yeah, let's look whether this works here. No, he doesn't want me to. Um, oh, doch, yeah. So, suppose this is one track. Yeah. Yeah, the track might be about here. Then the next track would be... Um, about here. And the next track down there would be uh, about here. Yeah. And now how do, how do we control the position of the head? Oh yes, and uh, I forgot something. The disc is partitioned into, I guess it's 18 sectors. So, 18 such sectors. Why does the disk have sectors? Actually, we would, it, everything would be easier if there would be no sectors. But these sectors are just because of the control of the read-write head. This is kind, uh, it's a sensor. It's a sensor that tells us whether we are still on track or off track. And look, if there is one sector, and this is the track, then between the two sectors, there is this servo area, servo sensor area. And that's what we see here. Look, from here to the left we have a sector. This is our servo burst area, and here comes the next sector of the, of the disk. And now what happens is, if the head enters here, then first you see this black line. This black line means a constant strong magnetic field. So the, uh, the head will detect, this is my trigger signal. And now it will set its internal clock to zero. And it will, it will count the, uh, the, I don't know, the microseconds from here and then it can determine, it knows the distance and because the speed is constant and we know where we are on the disk, we can actually, just by, uh, based on the time, determine exactly where we are. So we are now on this first burst, set of bursts, then comes the second, the third and the fourth. And now these black rectangles, they are rectangles of constant magnetization. Now, if we are on track, 
So suppose the, per the, the middle of the track would be here. Then we would have constant magnetization here also and yeah, no, no, that's not true. I mean this means um, a positive magnetic field and this means negative. Uh? And if you would look at a cross section here of the magnetization, then you would see this is a perfect sine function. It would go like this. So here maybe we have the, the positive magnetic field, here we have zero and here we have negative. So actually our track is somewhere here. Uh? Somewhere here where you have zero magnetic field. So here you have zero and there you have the, the opposite sine function. Here the function looks like that. So this means if you are here perfectly on track you would have zero field, zero field and then here you would have a positive field and a negative. Uh? Um, so if you are on track then the magnetic field should develop like over time. So if here we have the time it would start like and here you have the start, so the start means we are here then it would be zero for this first portion. In the second portion we would have zero. In the third we would have a kind of a negative field and in the fourth we have a positive. Yeah. So if, if the head is on track it would read this pattern. If the head is to the left of the track, then the pattern would be somehow a little bit positive, then the same negative, then strongly positive and strongly negative. So depending on the pattern that the head reads, we know how far we are off track to the left or to the right. So. This is the sensor signal and from this we can determine how far we are off track to the left or to the right. And depending on this uh, sensor input, then what happens here, so I don't remember exactly, yeah, I guess from here to, I don't know how much uh, space there is, yes, uh, I'm sorry, so this is not the beginning of the sector. So of course you need some distance to get your head back on track. So suppose we are now off track. So we move for example like here and then we read and at this position we now can start controlling the head back on track. So then it would move kind of like that and be on track again. And of course you need a certain distance and, and I don't know how much this is. But that's the idea how it works. And of course this is non-trivial to, then to know uh, how long we should apply how much voltage in order to get back on track again. Okay, yeah. And this pattern here these servo bursts, that's what we used to get our random numbers. And what normally happens in the, in the hard disk is they read these signals. And of course on these signals, on top of these signals, there is some random noise. So this is not a perfect sign because, I mean, of course, this comes from our read-write head. So the head reads some signals and there is some noise on top of it because this is all magnetic physics on the atomic level. So it's not a perfect sine function. It's kind of a sine function with uh, quite a bit noise on top of it. And now what these guys do is um, they apply a low pass filter on it so and this means they just throw away all the noise they put the noise into the garbage and they exploit uh, the real signal below it 
And now what we had to do is just uh, take the garbage can. Huh? So we throw away the basic signal and try to exploit this random noise on top of it. That's what we did. Huh? Um, and we, so we had some software. There is some low-level software where you really can read everything from the hard disk. And we, we read these signals, the servo bursts. And what does it mean, read signals? Of course, we do it from our PC. And we get these signals here after the analog digital converter. So, of course, we get bits. Huh? And actually, this, we read the, this amplitude. And this amplitude is, it is one byte. It's one byte. Huh? So, 200 and, uh, sorry, uh, 8 bit with 256 different values. Uh, and, oh no, sorry, it was 16 bit. Yeah, it's a 16 bit signal. It's two bytes. It's two bytes. Huh? Um, we read these two bytes and we get a, a 16 bit number. And now our first idea was. Uh, we do a, a Fourier transform of this number, of this, this number, then cut the low frequency part off, keep the high frequency part, do a back transform, maybe a fast Fourier transform, back transformation, and then we have thrown away the, the real signal and we keep the noise. And this worked well, quite well, but of course it takes a lot of uh, time. Huh? And we want, of course, to have our bits in high frequency. And then we thought, what could we do? How could we improve it? How could we make all this faster? And at the end, um, the result was quite simple. Um, what we did is, we do, we do have our 16 bits. So there is the, the uh, let's call it the high byte and the low byte. Huh? And we just, the first step was just throw away, throw away the high byte. Huh? Because the noise, of course, here is inside the low byte. And then in, in the low byte, we investigated our 8 bit. Huh? And looked at the quality of all these 8 bits. I mean, what we did there is the same thing that you have to do with this pseudo-random number generator. Huh? We looked at bit number one, two, three, four, up to eight. And what we found out was that the first four bits, these first four bits, the lowest four bits, they gave us high quality uh, random bits. Yeah, let's, let's look. Um, I guess we do have a picture here. I mean, that's what we did at first. Here we have the time, and here we have the amplitude of, you see, bursts. Huh? We have the amplitude of the burst signal. And you see it's between 0 and 256. So we are just looking at the low byte now. We already threw away the high byte, and here you can see this is not perfectly random. You immediately see there is some structure inside, so we have to be careful. That's what we saw first. And now, yeah, look, here we have the symmetry test. Symmetry test, and that's exactly the symmetry test I described last time in the lecture. Um, what do we have here? We have n1 divided by n total. n1 is the number of ones divided by the number of bits. 
and we want to have 0.5 as a result. So this is what we want, 0.5. And now, I mean, look, here we have quite a rough scale, 0 0.45, 0 0.55, and, we look, and when we look at the bits, bit number 1, 2, 3, 4, you see up to bit number 4, this looks perfect. Yeah? Exactly 0 0.5, and now if we go to bit number 5, 6, 7, 8, you see it really gets far off 0 0.5. For example, here this bit number 8, is 0.35, which is by far not accept acceptable. <coughs> I mean also this and this are, is not acceptable. And we have uh, three different curves from three different drives, uh, three different disk drives. Yeah. Okay, but I mean this of course is not sufficient just looking at such a picture. Because, I mean, I guess we took one or ten million bits. So this is the average over millions of bits. Um, and with the one million bits, our, the, the sigma is quite small. We calculated it last time. I think it's something like one over a thousand. So it's, yeah, 0.499 would be acceptable or 0.501, but we can't see it on this scale. So we have to look at it a little bit closer. Yeah, and here we have a logarithmic scale. Uh, so, yeah, this is n1 divided by n total, so this number should actually be one half. And then we sub subtract one half from this and take the absolute value. So this figure should be um, zero. It should be um, as close as possible to zero. Yeah? And now, so if we, I mean here we have a logarithmic scale, if we have a linear scale then um, on a linear scale our results, we, here we have zero and here we have um, two sigma the, then our numbers should be in this area between zero and two sigma huh? It, it can't be negative because we have the absolute value. And now if we take the log of this, then we see, I mean zero would be down here at minus infinity. And here we have uh, one power, uh, 10 power minus 6, <coughs> and here we have 10 power minus 4. And this is the two sigma limi limit we had. And so you, you see that <coughs> we do not perfectly fulfill our symmetry condition. So we are yeah, not too much, but yeah, mm, I don't know, a factor of eight or something outside the two sigma limit. So these, these numbers are not um, perfectly random. I mean, they are not very bad. I mean, here it's getting very bad. But it's not perfect. We are having a symmetry problem. Yeah. And I'll now tell you how to solve this symmetry problem, if you have no questions up to this point. Actually, yesterday evening I sent you this paper by email, so you can uh, have a look at it if you want to, more, know, to know more details. 
Mm, yes, or did I forget something? Oh yes, um, I mean this was the first source. These bursts, these servo bursts, were the first source of randomness we exploited. And after we finished all this, and then Erhard came to me and said, oh, I have an idea how we can get more bits. Because the, the frequency of the bits was not extremely high, of course. I mean, we just exploited um, these tiny areas between the sectors. And when the head um, flies over a sector, we don't exploit anything. Huh? And then he came and said, oh, why don't we exploit the channel? The channel is, I mean, that's when the read-write head reads the ordinary bits. And when it reads the ordinary bits, we do have the same situation as it is here. So we just take the ordinary bits and then uh, we do the same filtering we did here. And this gave us, first it gave us, uh, of course, m um, much more bits. And second, the quality was even better than the quality we had here. Yeah, maybe i tell you now a little bit about how the signal, when, when the read red right head reads the bits, how the signal looks like. Once I talked for a few hours with one of these, that's the so-called channel group. Huh? Uh, that's the group that uh, has to read the bits from the disk. And this is, I mean, yeah. That was surprising too for me. So when when the, our our head flies just uh, between or, or on the sector and reads the bits, then maybe naively one would expect a signal like that. This is a one bit and this a zero bit and maybe we have two one bits here, and so on. That's what we naively would expect. Huh? What you actually see, if you, if you look at the, the input signal, is perfect randomness. You see something like that. Huh? So there is no chance, there is really, there is no chance to detect any structure or signal. And from such a, at the first glance, perfectly random noise, these guys extract bits. And you all know, whenever you use such a computer, with very, very, very high quality, you can extract the bits. So. Did you ever experience that there is an error message, oh, the hard disk is unable to read your bits at the moment? And, and that's what's really surprising. I mean, I have never seen such tough engineering as in this company. Huh? I mean, this is really tough engineering. And then they do have the challenge to every two years uh, double the, the storage density of their disks. Huh? That's really, that's perfect engineering. Why do we have this randomness here? First, so if the, let's look at this picture. When we, when we, um, write the bits. So this is our, our uh, digital signal. A one bit, a zero bit, one, one, zero, zero. Huh? Then how is this written? What they write to the disk first of all is they write the first derivative huh, of the signal. So here, nothing is written. 
And here it is negative, so you get a, a negative peak, you would get a negative peak here, and then it goes back, and then here you would get a positive peak, uh, nothing here, a negative peak here, and a positive peak here. That would be what you get ideally. And I mean, of course, this looks uh, perfect. Uh, it's very easy to read, and that's actually why they use the first derivative. Because this is even easier to read, because negative, negative uh, voltage, positive voltage, and so on. So you just kind of just have to look at the sign. But now comes the next challenge. St storage density. Of course, we have to put these bits closer together, as close as possible. I mean, this is a waste of, of uh, storage space. And what they do is, if you look at such a peak and you approximate this peak with a normal distribution, a Gaussian, then what they do is, and that's really surprising, I mean, the width the 95% confidence interval is uh, you have mu plus and minus 2 sigma. And within one sigma, they store three bits. Okay? Within one sigma, they store three bits. Uh, no, two sigma. So plus or minus one sigma, they store three bits. So we have actually three bits stored on, on such an, an interval. Uh, and, and now, um, so now the picture looks more difficult. Um, yeah, so now the sigmas are getting much bigger. So here we have the width of one bit, so then this looks like, like that. Uh? So we have this positive peak and then there is something negative here and there is, uh, what is this? No, no, this, is, this was negative. Okay, sorry. So we have this negative Gaussian here, we have a positive Gaussian here, we have a negative one again here and a positive one here. And now these are all ad, uh, being added up. And the sum then, let's approximate the sum. So we have something negative here, positive here. So it would be like, like that. And then negative here, something like that. Huh? And now, on top of all this, there is noise. That's what, what you get. So you basically see the noise, and below the noise there is a little bit of signal. And of course this is really ingenious engineering, to extract these bi the bits with extremely high um, uh, quality. Yeah. Okay, so you see, what we did is actually the easier part. We just took the noise and we had to filter out this basic little bit of wave be uh, below it. Yeah. And I mean, what they do is, the channel group, they filter out the noise. Huh? <coughs> so, yeah? Is the signal content or the amount of bits the same in the inner circuits than in the outer circuits? Oh no. Uh, um, so uh, if you look at such a sector, then of course the length of the track is shorter here than it is here. Yeah. But uh, the same amount of bits, I guess. No, 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 no. The number of bits is much, uh, much more, uh, larger here. 
Yes. I mean, it, it can't be, I, I don't know all the details, but uh, if you would have the same number of bits here and here, that would mean you would, uh, you would spoil a lot of the storage density of the disk. I mean, this is not really a problem, having a different number of bits on the outer tracks than on the inner tracks. What's the problem? The, the controls between the bits? I mean, the, then you have to know how many bits there will come or what? Yeah. <coughs> but I mean, the, the, the read-write head always knows on which track it is. Huh? So it knows the track number and depending on the track number, uh, it knows how many bits it, it would expect. Yes. Uh? And I don't know whether the number of bits varies from every single track to the next. Maybe there are 100 or 1000 tracks here with a certain number of bits and so on. Uh? But I don't know these details. Uh? But I, uh, the, the, the thing I can tell you is that everything is extremely optimized. Uh? They optimize everything extremely. Oh yeah, and let me tell you a last uh, story. I mean, we invented this random number generator on the hard disk. And finally, we filed a patent, actually two patents, about this invention. Um, and then, uh, of course, our idea was that maybe in the future every Maxtor hard disk has such a random number generator built in and on every computer with such a hard disk you can get your perfect random numbers. And then, uh, I mean, of course, we had to talk to the salespeople because they had to, I mean, these guys are the people who decide which products or which features of the product to offer to the customer and we could not convince them. Finally, they said, we will not offer this new free feature to the customers. Huh? And their argument was, their only question, their only question, we discussed with them long times, very often, evenings, we just talked with them. Their only question was, please tell me how many cent one hard disk will be cheaper with this new feature. We couldn't make the hard disks cheaper with this idea. Of course, it would actually be maybe one hundredth of a cent more expensive because what would have had to be done was they would have to um, employ a firmware programmer for around two or three months to change the firmware a little bit. They were not willing to spend this little bit of money um, in order to improve the firmware and to include this into the firmware. Huh? Because we couldn't make the hard disk by one cent cheaper. That's, I mean, uh, that's how, how tough this business is. It's just about how can we make the next hard disk with the higher density and one cent cheaper than the disk from the competitor. Why is it so tough? Because not you as an end customer buy the hard disk, the, 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 the computer manufacturers, they buy the hard disks and they buy 10 million hard disks for their new product and then when you buy 10 million hard disks it's a uh, one cent is quite a bit of money. Yeah, okay. So now let's, um, yeah, let's talk about our symmetry problem. We, we, we did have such a symmetry problem. Not a severe, just a tiny little symmetry problem. If we go back to the last picture, here you see that it's not a severe symmetry problem. Here it's a severe problem, but we throw away all these bits. Huh? <coughs> but we had a symmetry problem. Nobody knows where this symmetry problem comes. I have no idea and we didn't investigate this. 
but we solved it and now yeah let's get back to our slides where do we have the slides Okay, ah yeah, and, and we have to actually skip the linear feedback, shift registers, yeah, and get here to the Neumann filter. There is a, again, we started doing research about how we can correct the symmetry of our random numbers. And there were ideas like applying a Fourier transform or whatever and but after doing some research, I found the Neumann filter. And look, this is one other ingenious invention of this big guru, John von Neumann. You all know this, uh, this name. Where do you know it from? Computer yeah, the von Neumann architecture. This is the architecture of the modern PCs, not modern, of all PCs, uh, including a processor, um, a random access storage and a bus. Yeah? This is the von Neumann architecture, but John von Neumann, he did so many inventions. He, uh, for example, in mathematics, there is, for example, the so-called von Neumann series. Um, and there is this little uh, Neumann filter. In, and he invented it in 1963. And this is a method, this is exactly the method we needed here. That's a method to correct bits which are asymmetric. And it's extremely simple. This is the function. So, I mean, look, we have a, a bit sequence and how do we correct it? We always look at a pairs of bits. So if my current two bits in the bit stream are 0, 0, then we will delete them. If it's 1, 1, we also will delete it. If it is 0, 1, it will be converted to a 0 bit. If it's 1, 0, it will be converted to a 1 bit. I mean, just looking at this scheme, it makes sense. Why does it make sense? Yeah. If the two successive bits are the same, if they are two ones, we will delete them. If they are two zeros, we will also delete them. This will lead to the result that if you have such a sequence of bits, which is as asymmetric as it can be, the whole sequence will be deleted. Or if maybe part of our bit sequence looks like that, we will just delete this part. And if another part is only zeros, it also will be deleted. And now from the rest of our sequence, I mean, we could actually just, just use this part, only this, without this. Would that work? I never thought about this. We just keep all the rest. Hmm, that's a good question. Would this work? Let's look at this example, maybe that helps us. This example, if our bit sequence <coughs> looks like that, if we would do nothing, we would just keep the sequence. If we apply the Neumann filter, then we start here, we get a 1, 0, which is a 1, and the next one, and so on. So we get, would get as the output a sequence of all 1s. I mean, this is actually the opposite of what we wanted. You see, the input is perfectly symmetric. 
it can't be better symmetric. And what the Neumann filter does is, it outputs a perfectly asymmetric sequence. Uh, yeah, this is viewed. Now, let's look at this example. I mean, this is something that looks quite random, and the output also looks quite random. But it's, it's still asymmetric, the output. So what's the benefit? Tell me how can five bits be symmetric? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> can five bits be more symmetric than what you have here? No. no. Okay. So it's perfect, okay? okay. But if you, if you would continue to the six bit, it could be asymmetric again, or no? Yes, but I mean, we already talked about this. We do not want to have exactly 0.5. If we have a finite number of bits, we do not want to have 0.5. Because this would be too good. Look, here. Here you have 0.5. And this is not random. And, I mean, what you see here is that the Neumann filter, applying the Neumann filter to such a sequence is not a good idea. Why is it not a good idea? Because these bits are structured. They are not independent. And what we want is symmetric and independent bits. If we want our bits only to be symmetric but not independent, I mean, then we could deterministically produce this. And then you have perfect symmetry. But we want our bits to be independent. And actually this property, the independence of our bits, this is what we get from physics. Symmetry is no problem. There is this little program, an infinite while loop, that always prints 1010. You have perfect symmetry. But the independence, that's why we need physics for. And uh, I mean, we made also, we made tests and arguments, and we could argument that our bits are independent. And now the point is this von Neumann filter only can be applied if our bits are independent. Only under the assumption that the bits are independent, you can apply the Neumann filter. If the bits are not independent, like here, it doesn't work. So the Neumann filter is also a nice tool to check independence of the bits. You can apply the Neumann filter if, and if afterwards you are still yeah. symmetric and you are also independent, your bits are independent. Yeah. That's actually what we did. Yeah? Of course, if the, pit, uh, the bits would be strongly dependent, then the Neumann filter would decrease the symmetry, or could decrease the symmetry. Yeah? Um, yes, and now let's look at the theorem. And here you can read it. Are consecutive bits in a long bit sequence statistically independent? And here you see this is the assumption. They have to be statistically independent. Then, after application of the Neumann filter, they are symmetrically distributed. And now comes the cost for the whole thing. You don't get it for free. The length of the bit sequence is shortened by the factor p times 1 minus p. p times 1 minus p. And p, what is p? P is the probability for one bit before you apply the Neumann filter. Now let's look at, look at the, this image. Look, here we have this shortening factor, P times 1 minus P, uh, drawn over P. And P is the probability for once. Of course, we want to have 0.5. So if the input of the Neumann filter is independent and p equal 0.5, then here you get 0.25. That's the cost of the Neumann filter. It is 
No, it's quite expensive. So if you apply the Neumann filter, you will lose three quarters of the bits. Yeah? Only 25% of the bits remain. And this is easy to see actually. Look at this here. You will lose these pairs and these pairs. This is already 50%. 50% of the bits are immediately deleted. If the input is perfect, huh? if the input is a perfectly random sequence, then you would lose half of the bits. And from the other half, you will again lose half, because these two bits will be shortened to one and these also. So this is why you only get 25% uh, output for this, if the input is perfectly symmetric. Now, if the input is perfectly asymmetric, the output is zero. And that's this example. That's perfectly asymmetric, no output. And if it's in between, yeah, then you get some value between zero and 25%. So it's, it is a decision uh, whether you apply the Neumann filter, especially if the situation is as we had it here. Oh, wh where is it? Um, oh, did I close it? No, it's this one. I guess it's this. Yeah. So if the situation is like that here, so we, are, we only have a tiny little bit of asymmetry and then we have to decide. Either we accept it and get all our bits or we pay. And that means we throw away three quarters of the bits and have perfect, perfectly symmetric output. And this of course, if this would have been sold as a hard disk, you would then have maybe the option whether you apply the Neumann filter or not. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we are now actually coming to the end of this hardware random number generation. Here. Yeah. And then next time we will have a short look into linear feedback shift registers which is another method for producing pseudo-random numbers. It's quite nice and simple so that will take us maybe 10 minutes next time or maybe 15 or 20. Um, and then we will go to the next chapter. Um, are there any questions about this real random number generation? <coughs> Could you use a data compression algorithm instead of a non filter? That's a good question. You could. But, of course it depends. There are so many different data compression algorithms and I mean you, you have to look at it, whether, what does it do with the symmetry? Yeah? I guess most of the compression algorithms would improve symmetry. Yeah, actually they should. Yeah? But, I mean, here we are talking, look at our Maxtor application, we are talking about a tiny little bit of asymmetry and so you really have to look at it very closely, you have to make tests and so on. Okay. Uh, is there any way to prove that any sequence is statistically independent? Oh, that's a very good question. We talked about this quest question at Maxtor uh, very lengthy. We had a lot of talks because I went to Erhard. We have to prove symmetry and independence. 
I mean, I worked quite, quite a lot about the symmetry, you have seen it. But the independence... I guess you can check the independence. After, after applying the Neumann filter, just check the symmetry. Um, yes, I mean, you would see if... If the result of the Neumann filter is bad, then you could assume your, your bits are dependent. But uh, getting a strong proof of independence, a, very, a really strong proof, is actually impossible. Huh? Um, yeah. I mean, the only arguments we got was by talking about the underlying physical process. And then we said, okay, here we do have some thermal noise. Yeah? And in physics, people know that thermal noise is statistically independent. That was the type of arguments uh, we used. But we, can, we, we couldn't... Um, okay, yes, that was first. And second, um, finally, the bits we output, uh, either before or after the Neumann filter, you have to make statistical tests. And one test is the symmetry test. But the symmetry test is not sufficient because it does not test uh, the independence. And therefore, you have to apply more than just the symmetry test. And that's what you actually also should do when you test our pseudo-random numbers. You have to apply different tests. And there are, there are tests like, for example, the Mohrer test, which is described in our paper. This is a test that, uh, that really tests randomness. Yeah? But this test is, uh, I mean, it's quite costly. It costs you a lot of computational time and so on. Um, and there are many other tests. There is, for example, the so-called die-hard test. Yeah? And the die-hard test consists of something like 15 different randomness tests. So this person has combined 15 tests, 15 statistical tests, or maybe it's even 20. It's really many tests. And it will test this first property, second property, and so on. And my sequence passes the die-hard test if it passes all these 15 or 20 different tests. Yeah? So testing randomness, including independence, is a tough business. Yeah? Uh, and, I mean, you will find, if you uh, do research on the internet, you will find a number of different uh, randomness tests. Uh, you could also go to the website of my cryptography book. There is a chapter on random number generators, and there you find a couple of links to uh, also randomness tests. Huh? Or you read the book from Donald Knuth, this book, Semi-Numerical <coughs> Algorithms. Hundreds of pages is just about randomness tests. Okay, thank you. <laughs>